Good morning, everyone. Uh, we can now resume with the class. Please notify me if you can able to see the slides before I, con I continue, because last week we had an incident whereby I was thinking you are seeing the slides, only to find you are not seeing the slides. Can you able to see the slides? I will need a confirmation from you. Even yes. If yes, we can see it. Okay, let's continue then. Uh, is there anyone who have a question with regard to the prior learning needs, the number five one, with regard to the question treated? Before we proceed to our learning number six. Uh, silent, I will assume that there is no question, then we can proceed to our learning need number six. So in, in, in learning number six, we are dealing with a situation whereby uh, our subsidiary was acquired during the year, because in the previous examples, we had a situation whereby we were acquiring the, the subsidiary in the beginning of the year, irrespective of whether it was uh, last year or the prior years, but the acquisition was made at the, at the beginning of the year. But in this one, the acquisition is made during the current year. So when the uh, acquisition is made during the current year, we need to apportion the, we need to have the portion before the acquisition and the portion after acquisition, because the one before the acquisition is the one to be used for the acquisition purposes, which it will be the one go to our column in our analysis of shareholders at acquisition. It will be used there for at acquisition. And then the one post the acquisition is the one which will be treated in the group. So first we have to check the date of the acquisition so that we can able to uh, do your proportion, whether it will be three months, six months, nine months, or seven months, depending on when was the date, uh, when was the subsidiary acquired. So let's have an introduction on page 691 on paragraph 6.1. Where they tell us that in the presiding lane units, the date of acquisition of an interest in subsidiary was always been on the first day of the subsidiary accounting period. But in practice, the effective date on which the delivery of shares take place every very rarely coincides with the end of the financial year. The purchase of an in, of an interest in subsidiary at a date other than the accounting date is known as the interim acquisition of a subsidiary. We therefore need to allocate the items in the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income to pre and post. So any item that will be found in our SPL, they need to be divided according to the pre and post so that you can able, so that at the end, you'll be determining the retained earnings at acquisition so that you will know that the one which they fall under the pre, they will go to your retained earnings at acquisition. And the one falling um, on the post, they will go to your profit on the, current year uh, profit when we are doing the analysis of shareholders. Then the apportionment of an item in the segment of profit and loss and other comprehensive income, it is not practicable to apportion the profit or loss of the subsidiary for any financial year with reference to the fact we may treat it as it accrued if we need to it from day to day during the year and apportion it accordingly. We must examine the income and expenditure individually to determine the basis on which we should apportion each item between the period before acquisition and the period since acquisition. So it, that's why I have mentioned that it's important to note the pre and the post. Then the apportionment of an item in the sum of changes in equity, we must account for the preference dividend in respect of the issued preference shares of the subsidiary on time basis, even if it is not being declared. So our preference dividends, will, we take them as they are counted on based on, on time basis. Even if it's not declared, we just know that we do have the preference shares that may need to be declared at the later stage. Remember, we in our accounting FAC 2601, we did mention that we take them as our preference shareholders. So before we declare any other dividends, we have to account for the preference uh, shares. 
irrespective of whether they be cumulative or non-cumulative. Because if they are cumulative, we know that we, we still have to declare the one which they were not declared in the prior years. But if they are not cumulative, then we can only focus on the one for the current year. So our preference dividends that the one that they need to be allocated, even though they are not yet declared, because normally we declare the dividends at the end of the year. But even though they are not yet declared, we just have to account them that they, they will be preference dividends that we may arise. So we have to also have the preference dividend of the pre, of the pre-acquisition and the preference dividends of the post-acquisition when we are dealing with our statement of changes in equity. But with regard to the ordinary shares, it will only be the dividend declared at the end of the year. So in this case, it means we will be only focused on the dividend of the post acquisition. So it means it will be the one going to reflect on your statement of changes in equity of the consolidation of the group. But the one for preference dividends, you will have the one which they're going to affect the statement of changes in equity on the post and the one which will affect your analysis of shareholders on the, the pre part. Then we can continue to the presentation part, which it will be the analysis of the example one. So on the 6.4 paragraph, they said the presentation of the consolidated statement of, of profit and loss and other comprehensive income and the consolidated statement of change in equity. The first step in preparing the consolidated statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income for the current year is to apportion the income and expenditure of the current year between the pre and the post. Once we have done this, we can draw up the consolidated statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income and the consolidated statement of change in equity using one of the two methods. But for the purpose of this module, we're going to only focus on one method, which it will be the one or having the pre and the post. So now let's tackle the example one. So we've got example one where we have St. Limited as our parent and South Limited as our subsidiary, whereby South Limited became the subsidiary of St. Limited on 1 July. So the acquisition was made on 1 July 2002 and the profit of South was earned even throughout the year. Consider the carrying amount of the assets and the liabilities of South limited to be equal to the fair value thereof at the date of acquisition with the exception of land and building. So there is an exception that was made here that the value for land and building is not equal to the value which is given on our pre-adjustment trial balance. So they need to be uh, adjusted somewhere, somehow. So it means we might ever have a revaluation or we must have a devaluation. So we'll see when we are checking the question. So note that sentence whereby they say, accept the land and buildings. The excess of the purchase price over the net carrying amount of the asset at the date of acquisition was due to the difference between the carrying amount and the fair value of the land, land and building. So whatever balance that we're gonna have, which it will be the difference between the purchase price we made for acquiring South and the value of the assets on the date of acquisition, that difference, it, present our evaluation or devaluation depending on the nature of our figures. So you must note that sentence. The required part they say draft the statement, the consolidated statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income and the consolidated statement of change in equity of CND limited for the year ended 31. December 2002, in a, a compliance with the requirements of the International Financial Reporting Standard to all their collaboration to the nearest rent. So first, the financial years in 31 December, and our acquisition, December 2002, and our acquisition was made on 1 July 2002. So we can see that the acquisition of this, of the interest was made during the year. So you're gonna draw your timeline, so where you determine your financial year. So our financial year is gonna start on 1 January 2002, and it will end on 31 December 2002. That's the first step. Then the second step, you determine your the pre and the post. The acquisition was made on 1 July 2002. So it means any period between 1 January 2002 to 30 June 2002, it will fall under the, po the pre. And any period between 1 July 2002 to 31 December 2002, it will fall under the post acquisition. So. Let me open my Excel in the meantime, so that we can able to show some of the explanations. Uh, 
I'm going to share my Excel. Please notify me if you see. I believe you can now see my Excel. Can you see it? Anyone can just say yes and then it. okay, then let's proceed. Analysis. For example one. So here we've got a pure, we're gonna draw a timeline for the financial year. So our financial year is from one. 01 2002 and then it end on 31 so our pre in this case our pre acquisition will be one twenty point two two thirty six twenty point two. Then our post Will be one July two eighty one. So this one, the profit. While this one at acquisition. So any profits made between the one January two thousand two to thirty June two thousand. 30 June 2002 will represent the profits which they're going to go to the retained earnings. For the acquisition purposes. And then the, the profits end between 1 July 2002 to 31 December 2002 will represent the current year part on our analysis of shareholders. So from there, we're gonna determine the percentage of the interest so that we can know how many interests were acquired. So when we check, we've got a share capital of 355,000 shares issued by South. And then we, as the CND, we acquired how many shares? 248,500. So we determine the percentage of the interest Determine percentage of interest, which it will be the two forty eight then we divide by the three fifty five. Which equal Seventy percent. 
So it means we as CND, we acquired 70% interest in South. Now we can determine our analysis of shareholders. So analysis of shareholders. We were told uh, When I have the ad acquisition, or actually to be total, then we have ad, then we have a NCI. Which you can say this is to be saying D. And the LTD at 70%. And then here it will be the ad acquisition part, and then also the scenes part. Then we have the ad acquisition here. Okay, can you able to see my writing on the Excel or must I make it bigger? The confirmation visible. is visible. Yes, I can see it. Okay, no problem. Then the ad acquisition, we're going to have the share capital, which it will be as per the, our example we've we were told that the share capital ordinary shares of south limited it was 355 if you can check on page 92. then we put our 355 here and then with the 70 percent interest it's gonna be 248 And then our NCI will be our 106. And then with a retain earnings, we were told that the retained earnings on 1 January 2002 is 120. So this will be the opening balance. So it will be the 101. 20.2. So the retain earnings on that date as per pre adjustment trial balance, it was 120. So we do our apportionment on based on the 70% capacity, it's 84,000. And then our NCI at 70% capacity will be 36. Then we're going to have the retain earnings which it will be the pre one, the one between 1 January uh, 2002 up to 30 June 2002. So that one is shown by doing the calculation from your the calculation based on if you calculate the profit part. So we're going to have the retain earnings. So this one is the, the apportionment between the opening balance in the beginning of the year up to the date where the acquisition was made. So it will be 1.01.20.2 to 30. It's So this one calculation, if you can refer to page 96, you will see how this uh, retained earnings was calculated. So the period between 1 January 2002 to 30 June, whatever profit that we're gonna realize there is the one gonna come here as the retained earnings here, because it will be the pre part. So whatever calculated as the post, it's gonna go to the current year on down there on the column when we'll be doing the analysis of shareholders. So if we have the gross profit of 162,000, I mean 166,200, 
for the total. And then we are pushing the six months between 1 January to 30 June, which it will be the pre, and then 1 July to 31 12, which it will be the post. So it will be 66. So 166, 200 divided by 2, it's going to give you 83.1. So we calculate everything there in order to have the profit. So the gross profit will less the auditor's remuneration, will less the depreciation, will less staff cost, will less the income tax, and then we, we get the profit for the year. And then uh, the profit for the year, it will be 80,000. So that 80,000 divided by two, then it's going to give us the 40,000. So that 40,000 is the one which is going to come as our pre from our calculation. So we do our percentages in terms of the 70% versus the 30%. So we're going to have the 28,000 here. And then we have the 12,000 here. Up to so far, is there any question? Especially with regard to this part, the one, this retain earnings. Any question with regard to this? I assume that no one may have a question. Then let's proceed further. Then we're going to have our totals. So we add this, which they're going to give us the 521. Okay, before we arrive at the 521, we, here we can assume as we don't know the figure yet. First, let's add this one. So here we're gonna have the total, which they told us that um, we did we did purchase this to the value of three sixty four seven hundred because on the adjustment they did notify us that any difference between our purchase price and the carrying value of this asset it will represent the the goodwill. So whatever we do here, any difference between this it will represent the goodwill. So here we we set our purchase price is 370, 364, 700. So here we're gonna put 364, 700. Then when we add this, this they don't give us the 364, 700. Instead, it will be the 248, 500 plus. Eighty-four thousand, twenty-eight thousand. So they give us three sixty-five hundred. So the three sixty-five hundred we less three sixty-four seven hundred. So the difference here is going to represent our revaluation surplus, as per the statement we were told that any difference between these figures, any difference between these figures and this one, it will represent the goodwill. As per the statement, we were told that uh, with the exception of land and building, the excess of the purchase price, which this is the purchase price, the excess of the purchase price over the net carrying amount of the asset, this is the net carrying amount of the asset. So any excess of this, it's going to represent the revaluation, it's going to be the difference which is going to be the revaluation of the assets as a result of the difference between the carrying amount and the fair value, because this will be the carrying amount, while the 364700 is regarded as the fair value of this asset. So this one will represent a goodwill.
And then in order to arrive, the figure of this goodwill, if you say, because he is at 70% and here is the total. So you want to take it the 70% and give it to the total. So you will say the three, 4.2 divided by 70%, then it will give you the total of 6,000. By 70%. Then it will be 6,000. So this 6,000 is going to come here. Then from there, we're going to have the, the remaining balance of this 80%, which is going to be our 1,800. Then we proceed further. So if this was at acquisition part. Now we're going to go to the Sorry, this is a revaluation, not goodwill. Revaluation. Okay. The exercise that we are doing is question one or ex question one or example one on page 92. Page 92, example one. The one who just joined now now so we have a revaluation surplus of of 4.2 so this came as a result of the the purchase difference between our 364 and the the net values of the asset now we're gonna go to the current uh, part or we can add to the totals of this Then we have our current, because since our purchase is equal, so we don't have any, we don't have any goodwill because the consideration given, we give, we gave it the consideration of 364. The consideration given is 364. And then our goodwill, it will be zero. Then we proceed further to the current part, or since acquisition to the end of the current year. And I believe now you understand why I'm saying since acquisition to the end of current year, not since acquisition, acquisition to the beginning of the current year, because this one, it doesn't have three phases. It's gonna only have two phases because the, op, the purchase, the purchase or the acquisition date versus the, the end of the financial year, they're all concerning the one current in the one financial year. Unlike if the, the acquisition was made in the prior years and then we are only dealing with the current year, which we're gonna have three phases in our analysis of shareholders. So now we're going to go to the current year. So current year, it will be the profit part. So any profit realized from the acquisition date up to the end of financial year. So this will be the profit between 1 July to 31. December so we when we go to our calculation of the allocation of the profits 
The profit realized between 1 July to 31 December is also 40,000, because this was based on six months. So it means here it's going to be the 40,000. Um, okay. So we put our 40,000 here. And then on the scenes part, because here we could add and and since so we're gonna we're gonna put it now here the thirty percent part of twenty eight thousand so our twenty eight thousand we're gonna sit here and then our twelve thousand will go to the last portion which to sit here. So this is the one which is going to use as an NCI in our thing, in our statement of financial position. Suppose we were asked to do the statement of financial position, we're going to use this one on our SFP, on SPL, sorry. Then we were told that this guy. Uh, there are dividends declared and paid on 31 December of 34,000. So these dividends were declared by South and South, which we acquired how many interest in South? The 70%. So 34,000 times the 70%. So it means we as a Current sending, we're going to receive only 23,800 in our draft statement of profit and loss, which we're going to see it at the later stage. But somewhere, somehow, the, the intercompany profit, they need to be eliminated. So we're going to have the dividend paid by subsidiary. And then she paid a dividend of 34,000. And then uh, apportionment, it's 23,800. And then uh, the 10,200. So this will going to be used as a part of elimination. Because we as the parent, we are going to get the 70% of this dividend, which is this. Then, so we are done with our, and have the two tiles here, which it will be the, Okay. It'll be the five two seven. And then here we're going to have our four point two. And here we'll have the 153,600 plus 12,000 less 10,002, which is 158. 
Then, this is the analysis of shareholders. Is there anyone who have question with regard to the draft of our analysis of shareholders? So that we can explain some of the things before we proceed to the journal. Um, hello? Hi. Hi. Um, okay, with regards to revaluation surplus, um, I'm not really sure how we got to that 6,000. Okay. You know, explain it back for us. No problem. Let's go back to the 6,000 revaluation. Uh, we had share capital go 10 page to 92. You have 355 from our subsidiary as our share capital. I guess that you and we are fine. We have 120,000 as our retaining earnings as at 1 January 2002, which is also presented in our example. Then this one we didn't have. We have to calculate it. So this is form is found in calculation two. So when you go to your calculation two, you will find that they have the pre and the post. So this one comes from the pre portion. Because it's anything that happened between 1 January 2002 up to 30 June 2002. So that is the 40,000, we calculated it. Then we had this, we had this, we have this, but this one is not given at all. This portion is not given. Now, the reason we calculate this is because of the statement. Now there is a statement which tells us that there will be a revaluation. So now let's let's find this statement which telling us that there will be a revaluation or a devaluation. When you go to your additional information, they say South Limited became a subsidiary of Sandy Limited on 1 July 2002. We are fine there. The profit of South was earned evenly throughout the year. So the profit was realized throughout the year. We are fine there. Consider the carrying amount of the assets and liabilities of South Limited to be equal to the fair value thereof on the date of acquisition. So they are saying the assets and the liabilities of this company, they are equal to the fair value. With exception, so now there's the exception that whatever asset is given and the liabilities is given, they must be equal to the fair value, which the fair value will be the purchase price that we're going to acquire the assets. But except the land and the building, where the land and the building they are not equal to the fair value of the consideration that we're going to pay towards this guy. So with the exception of the land and building, so the excess of the purchase price over the net carrying amount of the assets. So if we're going to pay 364, as we mentioned that we're going to pay 364,700, that excess or whatever amount which is below Let's take, let's hear what they're going to happen with it. So the excess of the purchase price over the net carrying amount of the assets at the date of acquisition was due to the difference between the carrying amount and the fair value of the land and building. So if there is a difference between the fair value of the land and building, that it can either be a revaluation or a devaluation. If our land is higher than our fair value of the purchase, which is the purchase price. So it means it's going to be a devaluation. But if our purchase price is higher than our fair value of the assets, so in, it means our land and building, they need to be increased. So when we increase our land and building, it means we have to revalue them. So that's what bring this uh, 6,000 of the revaluation. So we found that, that our purchase price or the fair value of the assets 
it's sitting at 364,700, excluding the land and building. So that excess, because when we add our 248, the 84 and the 28, they gave us a value of uh, 248,500 plus 84,000 plus our 28,000. They give us the value of 360. So our assets and the liabilities, they are sitting at 360. However, our purchase price is sitting at 364,700. So our purchase price is higher than our fair value of assets and liabilities. But the statement tells us that when we purchase in South Limited, we consider that our assets and the liabilities are equal to the fair value, which the fair value will be regarded as the consideration given or the consideration paid by us. Okay. It's okay. fine now. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense because I was going to ask about uh, what's this um, goodwill, where does it come into play? But that statement then uh, answers my question that you just okay. made now. Okay. All thanks. right. So since our consideration is equal to the fair value of the assets, so it means we're not going to have also goodwill. But in order to arrive to the 6,000 or the 4.2, it's because of the, we have to increase our land and building in order to be equal to our consideration paid. So now we can proceed further. Anyone who have a question with regard to our analysis of shareholders before we proceed to the performance journal so that we can do our elimination. So Mr. Malepo, if there wasn't um, the statement on the uh, exception of land and building, we mm. would record this as goodwill, right? Yes, we we are gonna have okay. our three sixty four seven hundred. So our four point two, it was gonna represent the goodwill. Okay, thanks. Okay, another question. So this, please note, this it can come with any other question. It's not because. We are only dealing with the consolidations that happen during the current year. Even if the consolidation happened in the beginning of the year or in the prior years, we can have this situation whereby they tell us that our fair value of the asset must be equal to uh, must be equal to the consideration given. So, but we tell we found out that when we are calculating our assets, they were not equal to the consideration. So it means somewhere somehow the land or the build they need to be revalued. Then after, then we have our goodwill or no goodwill. So it must, you must not say, no, that uh, exercise, it only applies to a situation where the acquisition was made during the year and the financial year is also in the same year. Any other question? Okay, I will assume that there is no question, then we can proceed further to a situation of doing our preliminary journal or the elimination of the intercompany items. So we're going to do our performance journals, which this one I may not draft them on the Excel because on the Excel I only show where they will be the treaties. Because remember, uh, teaching via the computers is time consuming as compared to when I was in front of you and then writing with hand. So the share capital, we've got the 355 at acquisition, which is the one who calculated from our analysis of shareholders, is represented by this one. So you're going to turn a page, you can go to page 96. So we are answering the pro forma consultative journals. So from our analysis, we have the 355, which is the share capital. Then we have the retained earnings. So our retained earnings is sitting at 160. The 160 came as a result of adding the retained earnings at the beginning, plus the retained earnings happened before the acquisition. So that portion, we have to add them all together so that we eliminate them because there will be the retained earnings happened before we do our group. So anything that happened post, it's gonna go to the group, but anything that happened before, it must be eliminated. Then we have the 6,000 represented by the revaluation surplus. And then the investment in South, it's 364,700, which is the consideration given. And then 
the non-controlling interest, it will be the 156,300. So that is the elimination of the owner's equity of South Limited at acquisition. Are we fine there? Which I assume that we are fine because there's nothing different done here with regard to our prior generals that we had. Now we're gonna go to the non-controlling interest of the 12,000. So this one is the 12,000 at the top. So the non control interest of the profit after tax, the 12,000. So it will be when it's not this one, this one was eliminated at the beginning because we eliminated using the, the 40,000 of the retained earnings. Now we're gonna go to this one. It will be this 12,000, this one. Is the non control interest and then on the SCI and the SFP. Then we're gonna go to the dividend. The dividends will be represented by this part where we had the dividend received by South. I mean, the, received, uh, the dividend received by South. So South received, received a dividend of 20, 23,800. But since they come from his subsidiary, he need to take them out. So normally our dividend received in the books of South they were gonna be on the credit side, but now because they represent an income, but now because we eliminate them, we put them on the debit side. So it will be dividend received. Then we received from Saint Limited, says two thousand three hundred. So the non-controlling portion it will be the ten thousand two hundred, and then the dividend paid. Normally the dividend paid they go into the debit side. I mean the debit side, but because uh, we are eliminating them. So we're gonna say dividend paid when we put them on the credit side, which will be the thirty-four thousand. And also note the issue of the names. Initially, when you do the journal on the journal of South, you're gonna say dividend paid on the debit side, and then you have the you have the bank on the credit side. But because now you are eliminating, you put them on the credit side. So you say dividend paid south. So you have to also be clear with name. If you say dividend paid, but you, you put Sandy, so the person who will be marking is gonna put you wrong, even though you said your dividend is on the credit side. But for the fact that you put the wrong name of that group, of that uh, uh, of the of the company. So it means you said in this case you were saying the dividend were paid by Sandy Limited, not South. So as a result, the person is gonna give you a, a a wrong then, even though the amount will be 34,000. But for the fact that you return the wrong contra account instead of South, you put send. So make sure that you are familiar with putting the names like the same I will apply to the loan paid to a subsidiary, loan paid to the parent. The same will apply to the situation where the inventory was sold to the subsidiary or was sold to the parent. That elimination of those profit you have to put into the correct. Uh, name of the company. Then after that, we're going to draft our consolidation, which it will be the statement of profit and loss and SCE as per required. Is there any question with regard to where we are right now so that we can clarify whatever you, not, you didn't understand? Silent, I will take it as if there is no question. Then we proceed further. Then we go to our SPL, which it will be our statement of profit and loss. So in the statement of profit and loss, we had the gross profit. So now here you're gonna focus on things happen for, from the subsidiary point of view. You're gonna only focus on things happen on the post acquisition. So it will be parent, the total of the parent plus the post acquisition of subsidiary. So hold on. Uh, let me do this. Put on in the second. OK. 
Okay. Then for, for the drafting of the SPL. The focus will be the total um, parent plus post acquisition. from subsidiary. So anything that happened on the post side is the, the one gonna go to the statement of profit and loss because the one happened in the pre, they were eliminated at the acquisition when we were drafting our owners of shareholders and also doing the pro forma journal. So those ones, they were eliminated. They are no longer forming part of the group. So now we go to the post part. So anything, if you go to a, a page 96, Whatever happened between 1 July 2002 to 31 12 is the one going to be included in your statement of uh, profit and loss. For example, if you say 4227700 plus the 83,100, it's going to give you that total of 505 without doing that multiplication thing. 422700 plus 83,100. So they give you the 505,800. Then the administrative expenses, the same thing. You're gonna say the 102,000 plus the, so our administrative expenses, you're gonna have to check which one they form part of the administrative and which one they don't form part. So in this case, all your, your auditors, the depreciation, the, we have the depreciation, It just sold on when I'm getting something to write here. We have your depreciation going to form part of your administrative expenses. And then the staff cost. And then you have your auditor's remuneration. So it will be staff cost, depreciation, and the auditor's remuneration. So those ones will be regarded as your administrative expenses. Then from there, so it will be the 102 plus the half of what you what you calculated from the the the, the 2.5, the 21,000, and the 70,500. So those halves, they are the one which they go to your administrative expenses. Then from there we have your finance cost. So your finance cost. Uh, From the, our pre-adjustment trial balance, we had uh, interest paid on overdraft. So you have the 3.8. If you check on your pre-adjustment trial balance, you have interest paid on bank overdraft from St. Limited, which is the parent. So you put that 3.8 there. So you have profit before tax. So it's going to be the 505,800 less the 2.6500. Then you'll arrive at 255,500. So that one is going to form part of the note. Then we have income, income tax expense, which will be the 12,000 plus the half of the 4.2, which it will be the 2.1. So 12,000 plus 2.1, they give you 14.1. So you say 255 less 14.1, they give you 241,400. So your total profit is regarded as 241,400. But that total profit needs to be apportioned between the owner's equity of the parent versus the non-controlling. So you're going to say the 241,400 minus the 12,000. So the 12,000 will be the one calculated from your analysis of shareholders, the one which you are presented by the B in your page 96. So in page 96, we've got the 12,000, which is shown as B. So that is the one which you're going to less here. 
241 less 12,000, the one is represented by B, it's going to give you the, the 229,400. So the 229,400, it will be your owner's equity or your owner's attributable to the parent. And then the 12,000 from the B side of your analysis, it will be represented as your non controlling interest. Then we can proceed further. Then you have your note for the profit before tax, which is just you just show how did you arrive with that uh, the profit before tax. The profit before tax was calculated, taken into account in the auditor's remuneration, the depreciation, and the staff cost. Then you do your consultative sentiment of change in equity, which is going to be represented by the share capital of the parent, which is 800,000 from Sandy Limited, because the one for subsidiary is eliminated. Then we have the revaluation surplus as calculated from our calculated from sorry the revaluation surplus is eliminated sorry we have the share capital is eight hundred thousand then we're gonna go to the retained earnings on the retained earnings we have the retained earnings four eighty from the balance on one January two thousand two as the opening because the one for one twenty was eliminated when we are calculating our ad acquisition part. Then we come to the profit for the year is the, the new calculated profit for the year attributable to the parent of the 229400. Then we have the dividend paid by parent. So the parent declared the dividend on 31 December for an amount of 80,000. So we pay the 80,000. And then we're going to arrive at the balance at 31 December 2002. Which it will be the 629400. So we add our share capital and the retained earnings, they give us the total. So we have the non controlling part. So the 156300 for our equity on the date of acquisition is the one which comes from the analysis of shareholders on sh shown as A. The total when we're doing our, let me share back my Excel. So the 153, this one is the one which is going to represent your non-controlling on the statement of change in equity. And then the 12,000 for the profit for the year, it will come from this. And then the 10,200 will come from this. Then you have your non-controlling part. Then you add the total plus the non-controlling dash into 1280. We have 156,300 on the total equity. The 12,000, which will be the 22. 9 400 plus the 12,000, they give you the 241. So the 80 plus the 10.2, they give you 90.2. Then it will be your total for the equity. So that is the end of this uh, question on the calculation or showing the difference between when the acquisition was made during the current year versus when the acquisition was made at the beginning of the year. So did we understand the situation where the acquisition was made during the current year and we are also drafting the same financial statement for that particular year? Did you have an understanding? I will need the confirmation from you so that, that we can proceed. So we've got question question one, which is the same method whereby the acquisition was made during the current year, but this one they were not done in a half yearly instead it was three is to nine. So the first three months it was the acquisition, the pre-acquisition, and the, the remaining nine months was the post-acquisition. But I will request you to draft that uh, question on your side and check if you can able to understand it. And then if you don't understand them, you'll ask a question on the next class so that I can clarify that part. But I would like us to proceed further to a situation where now we are having the intercompany transaction, which it will be learning unit number seven. Are we clear there? Yes, we are. Okay. 
And now let's focus on the limit number seven, whereby now we've got the intra group transaction. So we as the parent, we are selling things to subsidiary or the subsidiary is selling things to us. So how do we treat them within the group? So some, they're gonna be taken over, some they will be eliminated. Let's share the slide. So you can able to see the slide. Yes, we can. Okay. Now we focus on the limit number seven, where there are transactions happening during the current year. The parent is selling things to subsidiary, subsidiary is also selling things to the parent. So only the profit realized outside the group is the one which was taken into the group consideration. But the profit realized within the group, they say because A sold things to B or B sold things to A. So those one need to be eliminated. Then we've got, uh, if you check the page 107, they say in this learning unit from the introduction paragraph in the present limit we introduce you to the basic consultation process for the wholly and partly owned subsidiary but in this learning unit we are dealing mainly with the intergroup transactions that take place in groups and therefore have to be eliminated from consideration purposes we will deal with the trading inventories as well as the property plan and equipment held in the group we would like to emphasize that we do not deal with the taxation of the unrealized intergroup profits and the losses so the intra-group bills of exchange and the bank overdraft. A bill of exchange is a negotiable document. It's, it's a written instruction directed, directed by one person, another instructing that person to pay upon the demand a certain sum of money to the person nominating the bill of exchange. For example, we've got bill number triple one, which is, is, is issued to P limited. That he must pay an amount of 2000 on one, I'm on 30 November 2008 to S Limited. So S Limited will treat this as a bill receivable. So on the books of P is bills payable, but on the book of S it will be bill receivable. So while P will show it as a bill payable upon the consolidation, the subsidiary bill receivable will be offset against the bill payable in the P Limited record for group perspective. The group cannot enter into traction with itself. So that's why I say whatever transaction happened between us, they need to be eliminated. So S could have converted the bill into cash before 30 11, 2008 by selling it to the financial institution. This type of transaction is known as a discounting. On consolidation, we may only offset the bank overdraft of one company in the group against the favorable bank balance of another company if both companies have their accounts on the same bank. So also note there will be a situation whereby maybe one of the group have the bank overdraft and the other one have a current, they have a favorable balance. So if they are using the same bank, we can offset them. But if they mention that they don't use the same of, they don't use the same bank, so you don't offset them, you're gonna take the other one as a bank uh, overdraft and the other one is a bank favorable. So if they both companies, they have the same the bank account and the company with the favorable balance has a guaranteed the overdraft of the other company or the bank itself will offset the two amounts against each other in terms of an agreement between the two companies at the bank. So now we're going to go back to the situation where we are doing the revaluation. So the revaluation of the property at acquisition, which it will be reflected by the question one and the question two. So here we've got a uh, on page 109, question one, we've got A Limited who acquired 80,000 shares in B Limited. On 1 July 2001, each share carries one vote. At the date of acquisition, the land belonging to B Limited were revalued to 200,000. No adjustment was made in the financial records of B Limited. So we can, we are being informed that the land of B Limited was revalued to 200,000, and then the retained earnings were 46,000, which this is the retained earnings at the date of acquisition. 
And then on 30 June 2004, the trial balance of A Limited and B Limited were as follows. A Limited got the credit side, the share capital, the rent rate 100, retained earnings 121 and 92. That's the balances on 30 June. And then the long term borrowing C Limited, 140, A Limited, 80. And then uh, it means in this case, on A Limited, they made loan to C Limited. But on B Limited, they made loan to A Limited. So it means that loan of 80,000 somewhere, somehow, it needs to be eliminated. So the current liability is 15,066,000. debit, lend at cost 250, 140. Investment in B Limited at fair value, cost price is 164. Loan to B Limited, 80. And then uh, and then the current assets 81,298. Consider the carrying amount of all other assets and the liabilities of B Limited to be equal to the fair value thereof on the date of acquisition. So here we are told straight that we consider that the fair value, the asset and the liabilities will be equal to the fair value of the date acquisition. So it means there's not that trick of the revaluation subplot. So it means in this case, our revaluation subplot would come straight without not doing, without, without checking the balance figures. So we have to draft the consensus standard of financial position for the A Limited and its group for the year ended 30 June 2004. So now we have to check answering our question. Uh, let me go back to the sharing of the Excel. So in this case, this was example one on learning unit number six. And then we're gonna have an uh, Example one, seven. Because if you understand the, how you do your analysis of shareholder, then it will be easy to answer any question that pertain to that particular question. So now we have to draft our analysis of shareholders. First, the three methods that we use. One, determine the interest. Two, you do your analysis. And then three, to eliminate intra-group or common items. And then four, you consolidate the remaining. So this is the basic rule of answering this module. Like any question that comes, this is the basic rule of answering it. So you determine their interest. So in this case, we are told that we, as a limited, is there anyone want to ask something? Okay. In this question, we are told that uh, the share issued by B limited is 100,000. And then we, as a, we acquired how many shares? Did you mention it? Okay, we are acquired 80,000. So 80,000 shares acquired divided by 100,000 issued by B Limited. It gives us 80%. So 
we have found them. Now we're going to do our analysis. But before you do your ana analysis, you need to determine the draft the timeline. You draft the timeline so that you can able to check how will it be your your analysis of shareholders. So in terms of our timeline. The acquisition was made when, or we can start with the financial year. The financial year is running from 1 July 2003 to 8 June 2004. That is our fin year. Our fin year is 1 July 20.5. To 30 June 20.4. So our analysis of shares that will be divided how into how many? The ad acquisition part. Acquisition is 1 July. 2001 and then uh, since acquisition since acquisition will be 2 July 20.1 to 30 June 20.3. And then current year, will be or the since acquisition to the beginning of the current year. And then the current year will be one, July 20.3 to 30 June 20.4. Are we clear with this timeline? Anyone who doesn't understand, please notify me because it's the one who's going to guide the line guide us how do we draft our analysis of shareholders. Glenn Rose, can you please mute? Okay, thank you. Then we proceed. Our analysis is going to have total. We have a B limited BLTD at 80%. And then we have a NCI. Then here it's gonna have the ad and the scenes. Now we have share capital. Share capital, which the total for B limit is 100. And then uh, At acquisition, it will be 80,000 because it's at 80 percent. And then the NCI will represent by 20,000. And then we have the retain earnings. needs. 
which is the retain earnings on retain earnings on one lie twenty point one the date of acquisition. So the retain earnings on that, that date it was regarded as forty six thousand in the statement given. So the eighty percent of it is thirty six thousand eight hundred and then the twenty percent of it to be nine point two and then now they mentioned that on that date of acquisition at the date of acquisition the land belonging to B were valued at 200,000 but we did get the figure that the land at cost for B limited initially it was 140 at the date he acquired it but now today when we acquire him his land is no longer valuing 140 in state is valuing 200,000 they tell us so now we say the revaluation so you can check this you can see there is a difference between this revaluation surplus and that revaluation surplus because that other one they didn't tell us straight instead they told us that the value of the asset at fair value must be equal and then you have to determine whether you have a relation surplus or devaluation. But in this case, they told us straight that at the date of acquisition, now the land and the building, they are valued at 200,000. But the date that we acquired that, the date that B Limited acquired the land, initially it was 140. So you're going to say the 200 as the 140. So it gives us the 60. So at 20% at 40% is 48 and the 20% will be the 12,000. So now you can do your totals. And the totals then you have the when you add this, they give you the two six. And then uh, 164, 41, 200. And then, based on this, we were told that our consideration paid by us consideration paid equal we paid an amount of 164,800. So in this case we don't have the goodwill. Our goodwill will be represented by zero. Then we can proceed. Then we're going to have since acquisition to the beginning of the current year. So when we check from the since acquisition up to the beginning of the current year, uh, his retained earnings now, it should be the one. 
we don't have the retained earnings at the beginning of the year. They didn't tell us. They didn't give us any retained earnings at the beginning of the year. So it means we don't, we're not gonna have that position. So the since acquisition, to beginning of current, it only, we only have this, if we have the retained earnings, retained earning on one July, on July 20 point three. So if we have, if we, if they give us the retained earnings here on 1 July 2003, then it means we're gonna put it as our figure. But because we don't have it, then it means it will be nil here and nil also nil. And then we have our current year. On our current year, we're gonna have the profit for the year. So when we close our books on 3rd June 2004, they already calculated the profit and added to the retained earnings. Now they say we have a retained earnings. Retained earnings. The retained earnings will be represented by the balance at the end of the year, which is sitting at 92,000. 92,000. We left the balance of the date we acquired him, which is 46,000. Normally, this figure in most cases, it's, it used to sit here, but it only sit here if we were given the balance on the 1st July. But since we, didn't, we were not given the balance on the 1st July, instead we were given the balance on 30 June. Was this the balance on 30 June? 36, 20.4. So that's why we are using the retained earnings here. Because normally this figure it uses to sit here. Then here we have a profit for the current year. So we had our retained earnings, which it will be sitting as 46. Then it's for the six thousand. And then we do our percentages, which is going to sit on thirty six thousand eight hundred. And the balancing figure will be the nine point two. Then it means in this case, our analysis is finished and we can close the figures. And when we close our figures here, we're gonna put the total of 252. And uh, we add all this. Then here, because these were sitting closed, eliminated, they are gone. And then we have the 36,800. And then we have the 5,400 because we add those, we add all this. Then we have 5,400. Then we can start recording our elimination purposes. So when we do our elimination, we're gonna eliminate whatever happened here on the date of acquisition. So they decided to start with the land. So our land, 
is increasing by 60,000. So since this land is increased by 60,000 and it will be carried further, we're still going to continue using it, this land. The land of B Limited is still going to continue using it. So that's why it's regarded as an asset here, and then it's going to increase. Land on the debit side, we create the remuneration surplus because the reason we're still going to continue using the land, we are not going to take it off. That's why it's not eliminated this part. So they, they, because if we got, they said the B Limited did not, no adjustments was made in the financial records of B Limited. So first we need to record this land for in the big of B Limited. So the land increased by 60,000, there was a revaluation surplus. Then from there, now it's gonna start to be eliminated as a performer general. So we say Shesh Capital, it will be this 100,000. And then uh, we have the 46 of the retained earnings, it's eliminated. The revaluation surplus is 60,000. And then we have a uh, goodwill, which is zero. And then we do we have the investment in B limited at a consideration of 164,800. So we have a non control interest of 41,200. Then from there is elimination for an SCPT of B limited at acquisition. Then we have a retained earnings. So the retained earnings, it will be this one. The one of 9.2 is the one which is going to be regarded as the non control interest. It's 9.2. And then we were told that there were loan made to these people. When we go to our pre adjustment trial balance, we've got loan by A Limited. A Limited issued a loan to B Limited, and while B Limited received a loan. So you have to do your contra account. Initially, when you do your journal on the book of A Limited, you are going to have loan to be on the debit side as 80,000. And then on the credit side, you're gonna have bank as 80,000. That is the books of A Limited. And then on the books of B Limited, you are gonna have, okay, let's do the contra account here first. And Intra-group loan. So on the intra-group loan, initially in the books of A Limited alone, he was going to account this as like this. He was going to have debit loan to A, I mean to B Limited. which it will be eighty and then on the credit side he was gonna have bank as eighty thousand and then in the books of B BLTD was going to have bank of 80,000. And then he have a loan. From A. Okay, sorry. Let me show my debit and the credit. So we have a debit and then here we're gonna have a credit which is eighty thousand. For now, for the elimination purposes. We're going to use this. 
when we eliminate, we use this only. We forget about the bank, we use this one. So it means now we're gonna say loan A limited on the debit and then loan B limited on the credit. Then we eliminate everything. Is it does it make sense? How do we eliminate? Especially the intra the intra group items like the loan, the bills payables, the the likes of the dividend received. Are we clear there? I will need a confirmation. Are you sleeping, guys, now? Hello? What do you say? Hello? Yes. Because yeah. everyone now is quiet. I have to call it by each one by name. <laughs> or maybe I'm talking because of the recordings. People, they are washing the dishes. No, 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 no. no. Um, yeah, I think it makes sense. I'm just thinking about it just to make sure that I get the, the context. But it's, it's, yeah, I, I understand. Okay. I don't know about the others. With you, Melo, I know I will call each one by name now. Yes, I'm here. Okay, are you understand the part of the elimination purposes? Yes. So that when you eliminate first, it will be best for you to draft the journal, the separate journal of that particular company, so that you know that when you eliminate, you forget about it because this is the same intra account, the bank and the bank. You focus on you, you remove the bank. Now you're gonna focus on the the loans themselves. So. This one was the loan to B, this one was the loan from A. So when you do your elimination, the one which was on the credit is gonna to come to the debit. The one which was on the debit is gonna to come to the credit. So we do and said it's fine. And then Stephen. Stephen. Okay, Stephen is away, I think. Tandega. It, it's fine. Thank okay. you. Okay, DK lady. DK. Okay, maybe she's away also. The Margaret. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you, sir. And you understand that portion of the elimination? Yeah, I do. Okay. Glenn Rose. I'm in here. I do understand. Okay, then let's Thanks. proceed. Let's proceed further. So we eliminated our intergroup items of the loans. Then we can start doing our journals because based on our principle or the steps that we are using, uh, we determined the interest. We did our analysis of shareholders. We eliminated our common items. Then we do the consolidations of the remaining. Okay, we draft. Okay, we 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 did this. Then we're gonna go to the consolidations. So since they want the statement of financial position and other books, we have to draft everything. So we're gonna start with our profit and loss if we do have. So up to the information given, there was nothing that we can do with regard to our profit and loss. So with regard to the statement of changes in equity, also. Up to the information given, there was nothing that we can do much on the statement of changes in equity. So we can focus, we can continue further to our PP, I mean to our statement of financial position. So on the non-current asset, we're gonna have PPE, which it will be the one for the parent plus the one for subsidiary, the 250 plus 140. They give us the 450. Remember, it's also after taking into account the revaluation because uh, initially. This land was uh, 250 plus the, it will be 250 plus 140, then plus the 60,000 of the revaluation, which now is, it will be as 200. So take into account that the revaluation of the land 
was taken into account with that 140 for be limited. So it will be 250 plus 140 plus the 60,000 for the revaluation. That's why now we say 250 plus 200. And then on the current assets, we've got 81,200 plus the 198. And then on the equity and the liabilities, we've got share capital. We're going to focus only on the one for the parent, which it was for 300,000. The one for subsidiaries eliminated. We no longer take into account. And then um, the loan, the loan they are eliminated because it was loan to A limited while, I mean, the loan to B limited while B limited also received that portion of the 80,000. Since we did the elimination, we no longer take, take it into account. Then we go, we go to the liabilities. Okay, before we go to the liabilities, we must go to the retained earnings, sorry. Our retained earnings, we had the retained earnings of 121,000 of A limited. Then we must add with the retained earnings that happened during the current year when we're doing our analysis of shareholders. So the retained earnings happened during the current year. It was the one of the 56,800, this one. I believe everyone, everyone understand why we are using this 10 earnings was the one happened in the group. Now as the group continue forward, because it was within the period of one, uh, from one July, 2003, to 30 June 2004 in the current year while the consultation is running. So we take that 36,800 because it's the one that belongs to the parent. And then we add it to the 121, we receive, we have 157,800. Then we proceed further. We're going to have the long term borrowing, which it will be 140 as per the balance given from the long term loan to C Limited because C is outside our group. So we have to account them. But the one for A, if it was long-term borrowing, but A limited, we were going to eliminate it because it's within the group. So anything outside the group, it's going to form part of our group. But anything that was meant within the group, it needs to be eliminated. Then we have the current liabilities, which it will be the 15,000 plus the 66,000 then give us the total of 81,000. So that will be the end of our example one with regard to the situation whereby there were intra-group within the NTT and whereby there was a revaluation of land or building at the beginning of the current year. Anyone who have a question up to so far? The question two is also deal with the same situation whereby there was a revaluation made at the beginning of the year for the property but it's just in another context but we're going to also check it before we're going to go to the unrealized profit will be dealt more in the next class because i don't want you to get confused with how do you treat your the revaluations versus the intra account of the dividends received the the loan made the bills payables versus the profit to realize as a result of selling inventory, inventory sold by the parent, inventory sold by the subsidiary, the non-depreciable assets sold by the parent, the non-depreciable assets sold by the subsidiary, the depreciable assets sold by parent, and the depreciable assets sold by the subsidiary. Because each one of these, they have different way of accounting them in our financial records. So I will take things slowly so that you can able to adjust to each one as we go further. Anyone who have a question up to so far before we go to the question two? So the question two is more similar to the same as the question one. So you just have to note how the revaluation was made. So on the question two, page 113, they say P Limited acquired 70,000 interest in S Limited on 1 May 2002. So the acquisition was made on 1 May 2002. So that is the date of acquisition, which it will be at acquisition. Each share carries in one vote. At the date of acquisition, P Limited valued the land and the building belonging to S Limited with a carrying amount of 200,000 to add 300,000. So initially the land and building were valued 200,000, but P Limited decided to value them and said, now they equal 300,000. 
it is the company policy to value the land and building belonging to S Limited every second year at 31 August. At the date of acquisition, the retained earnings of S Limited were 20,000. So the following represent the considered prior balance of P Limited and S Limited at 31 December 2006. The share capital 180, retained earnings 160, 100. Long term borrowing P Limited. So the loan was made by P Limited to S. 100,000. Current liabilities 141 and 20. Revaluation of land and buildings 11150. Debit. Land at valuation 250, investment on S at fair value 140, and then unsecured loan 100,000, which will result from S limited, and then a current assets of 60 and 40. Consider the carry amount of all other assets and the liabilities of S limited to be equal to the fair value or thereof at the date of acquisition. You are required to draft the consolidated statement of financial position of the group S at 31 December 2006 in all compliance with the IFRIS. So we're gonna go to our analysis of shareholders. So on the analysis of shareholders, uh, this will be the analysis of uh, example two, then unit seven. Okay, then we have the same principle will be used. This principle, we're still gonna use it. So I want you to undo. I want you to get used to this. I want you to get used to this method of answering a question that you have to draft these things. You determine your interest. So in this case, um, we've got 16,000 shares issued by S Limited. And then we are, we are quite, they told us that it's already 70%. So there is no need to determine the given 70%. Given. And then, the analysis of shareholder, we draft the timeline. So as we draft our timeline, we wanna check the ad acquisition part. Acquisition. It was made on 1 May. Twenty point two, and then uh, since acquisition to the beginning of the current so it will be from to May 20.2 to day one December 2005. And then current year will be one and twenty point six two eight one. 
September 20.6. So we are fine there with our timeline. So it means in this case, our analysis of shares is going to have three parts. So let's proceed and see. So our analysis. So it's going to have the add part number the total. And as limited, 70%. And then the NCI. So we have a share capital. A share capital is regarded as how much? An amount of 80,000. AG and then on the ad acquisition part here it will be the ad and the scenes. In the ad part, we have the value of 56. And then on the NCI is 24. Then on the retain earnings given on the date of acquisition which is the date of acquisition as the retain earnings given. They said, uh, P limited value. at the date of acquisition, the retain earnings is 20,000. So this is the retain earnings on 1 May. 20.1. The retain, sorry, on 20.2, sorry. It was, 20,000 and then the 70% of the 20,000 is 14. And then uh, the remaining percentage, 6,000. Then we're going to have the revaluation surplus because they say on the date of acquisition, P decided to value the land and building of S from 200 to 300. So, at acquisition date, the revaluation, the land initially it was costing or it was valuing 200,000 less 300,000. So it will be 300 less 200,000, which give us the 100. So 70 here and 30 here. And then uh, now we're gonna do our totals. So we have the value of 200. And then 140, and then uh, 60. Then the consideration given or consideration paid. The consideration paid, it will be. 
the tools are that the amount paid by us as the parent to our subsidiary, we paid an amount of 140. So in this case, it means we don't have a goodwill. A goodwill is zero. Then we're gonna go further to the new column, which it will be the at acquisition or oh, the since acquisition to the beginning of the current year. Since acquisition, meaning of current year. So in this case, anything that happened, and normally this comes as a result of the retain earnings. If we have if we have a retain earnings at the beginning of the year, then we're gonna put it here. So any difference between the retain earnings at the beginning of the year and the, the retaining earnings at the at acquisition is the one which we're gonna put it here. So in this case, we are not given any retain earnings at the beginning of the year. So it means here we're gonna have zero. So in this case, it will be regarded as nil. So it will be nil value here. And then we're gonna go to the current year. Now we're gonna go to the current year. So on our current year, it will be the retain earnings because they gave us the retain earnings balance of uh, 40,000 at the end of the year. The retained earnings at the balance at the end, which is the balance at the end of the year. Balance at end of year. Excuse me, which the balance is forty thousand, forty thousand less the twenty thousand, which was the balance at the date of acquisition. It should give us the twenty thousand twenty thousand. And then on the scenes part, we're gonna push the footing. And then on the other part, it will be the six. Then we proceed further. We're gonna have the revaluation surplus. So the revaluation surplus, this one, it comes as a result of they told us that uh, it is the policy of P limited to value the land and building belonging to us every second year at 31 August. So this land, it was valued on 1 May 20, 2002. So from 2002, May, it's going to be August 2002. So from August 2002 to 
August 2003 to another August in 2004. And then from again August 2004 to August 2005 and August 2006. So this is revaluation that was happened on August 2006. So on August 2006, now the land, it was no longer valuing, uh, it was no longer valuing an amount of 300,000. Instead, it's now increased from the 300,000 to 350. Because if you can see, the land of S limited S at 31 December 2006 is now sitting at 350. But initially, it was sitting at 300,000 on the date of acquisition on May. So it means we had a period of one May. I can just put aside here, but it's just for you to understand. The land value, it was uh, initially, it was 200. And then it was revalued on the date of acquisition. And it was revealed to 100,000. Now the land, MV of the land, MV to be market value. The MV of the land is now sitting at 300,000. And then from there, which this date it was on one. 05 20.2. So on 31 August, since they revalue the land each and every on the second year, so it means they have the 31 August 31.08 20.2. They did a revaluation here. They did a revaluation of certain value, which we don't know, of x, x, x value. And then now we had a new MV, MV, which this MV will be on 31, 21.8, 20.4. And then, we have a market value that we don't know. Then from there, they do another revaluation on 31.8, So it's a revaluation surplus. of certain value. Then the MV, which now they say the MV on this land is now sitting at the 350. So if this is sitting at 350, so initially it was 300,000. So it means from this date on 1 May 2002 up to the 30 August 2006, 
this thing increased by 50,000. Because now we have to do the difference between this date. It now increased by 50,000. So it means we will say the 350, the 350, minus the 300, so it gives us the 50,000. Then that will be the revaluation surplus that's going to sit here. Which it will be the 50,000 here. 50 and then the percentage at 70%, it will be 85. And then the balance will be the 15,000. So are we clear with how did we arrive into this 50,000? Yeah, yeah, we're clear. But uh, on the study guide, uh, they've got it here as 150 minus 100. So where they got the they they said 150 minus 100 the 100,000 is this one but the 150 they did it as if like um because they they assumed that since initially it was a uh, it was 300 now it got increased to 350 so the revaluation surplus is the 100,000 that we had at the beginning you remember the 200 oh. minus the 200 minus the 300 it was 100. Yeah, yeah. So and okay. then another 50 extra. So that's why they said uh, okay. 150. But that's why I did this so that at least you can able to understand how yeah. did we arrive on this 50? Because according to them, you are gonna ask yourself where is this 150? Because I can't see it anyway. Yeah, yeah. But okay. in this case, I think it's more clearer that yeah. you see where is this 50 comes from. So it means. Maybe the revaluation it was three hundred, and then the XX amount maybe was twenty five thousand. Then it was three twenty five, and then it gives further twenty five thousand. Now it become three fifty. But I make it simple like here so that at least you can have an idea of how did you arrive with uh, this fifty thousand. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Another one who wanted clarity on this one. I saw you requested this uh, exercise. I mean, this exercises that we are doing. So I'm going to share them. I'm also going to notify Gregory so that they can upload them. The same page which they upload the recordings, they can upload this uh, and this uh, workings of my this my this my this workings so that you can able to understand when you while we are listening that uh, recordings. So are we fine up to so far? So. On my side, my time is up, but um, the only thing left is to do the um, the performer journals for the elimination purposes, and then you do your consolidations. So the only tricky that you may found on your elimination, it might be the loans for P and the loan for S, but in order to understand them, you're going to do the same method that I said, you must do the journal entry of, of, the, of them alone. Like you have to do this kind of a journal so that you can be able to eliminate your loan to P and the loan to S. And then another one, which it might be a tricky, it will be the revolution of the 15,000, it comes as a result of this, because it's the one which happened during the year. It will be this one for NCI, and then the 6,000 for the NCI for the profit, it will be this one. So I think the only tricky on the elimination, it was going to be the elimination of the loans but since you're gonna do them using this kind of a journal then you can able to get them in any other question that you may encounter anyone who have a question lucy you have a question lucy Okay, this is, seems like it's away. Margaret? Margaret, no, you have it? No problem. Okay, Stephen?
Stephen. Tandega? No question on my side. Thank you very much, Mr. Malik. Witty Melo? No question on my side. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, Mudise. Oh, I'm, I'm fine, thanks. No further questions. Okay, yeah, that's it. So, um, next we will be proceeding with the unrealized profit in the trade inventory. So, this one they will need more attention because there is no exam that you're not going to get the, the portion of the inventory. There is no exam that you're not going to get the portion of the depreciable assets. There is no exam that you're not going to get the portion of a non depreciable asset. So, all in all, this learning number seven, it needs a thorough attention when you are studying it. And also, when I'm presenting in the class, make sure that you understand. I don't pass anything without you understanding. There is no exam without learning number seven. If you write the exam without learning number seven, then you will not be writing FAC 2602. You'll be writing something else. I guess we are here then. And it can account up to a, a maximum of 60% in an exam. So it can you can gauge that is the overall module, this part of the learning unit. So we're gonna meet again next week, same time. Different venues, but it will be same time. Anyone who have a question up to so far? Sorry, sir. Hmm? Margaret? Yeah, me, I, I don't have a question regarding to the studies that you are doing. Um, I, I, I needed to ask about um, these classes because for first time I was receiving um, uh, the whatever to join the, the, the classes, the but now okay. I'm no more yes, I'm no more receiving them. I only saw it on on um telegram then i joined but i joined later because i only saw it later because i was keep on checking on my unisa on my um emails but i didn't receive anything okay just hold on gregory there's a question here where the student is asking how does she access these classes because uh, she said on the first time she received a link to join but now when she go to my unit, she can't find anything about these classes. So she wanna know how to join. Must she go back to the same email she received on the first time or? Hello, can I try and help there? <laughs> okay. Okay, because um, there e there's an email that was sent, uh, I think, when was it? On the 8th of... Um, on the 8th of July, yes. yes. So I, I normally use the same link. I don't get any other notification. I just go look for the email and I click on the link. I the also link. get, I also got a confirmation from Gregory, which is also sitting with me for recording purposes. He said um, the same link, the same email which was sent at the beginning is the one that we're going to use to access this class for the oh. whole month of July. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. I think uh, all all the recurring classes will be used on the same link. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it means from August you are going to receive a new link. Yes, and uh, they say they're going to send another link for the duration of August because sometimes it can be due to the time changes or something else. But they're going to also send a link for the duration of August and then again the link for the duration of September, even though we don't have an idea when is the exam because. We were only got that the exam there must be somewhere in September. We don't know if the units are going to consider the exams being in September or they're going to move them. That one we don't know yet. Uh oh, thank you. Okay, another one having question, even though it may not be the studies like the one which was raised by Margaret or the any one which is different, but it will be similar to how to access the class, how to access the recording, how to access the slides, stuff like that. Okay, since no one is saying anything, then I will look at that anyone is satisfied. Then we will meet again in next week. Um, you can revisit whatever I've studied or I've tackled in the learning unit number seven. Then where you don't understand, you are more than welcome to ask a question. 
and then we take it from there. So I saw someone send the student number for the to access the previous lesson. I will share this and uh, this Excel spreadsheet to, to this email that I got via this chat. And then someone said something about the WhatsApp group. Unfortunately, we don't have the WhatsApp group for this module yet. We only share things via Teams. Like if you send the email here on Teams, then we can access it from there. Okay, that's it from me. Have yourself a lovely Saturday and enjoy the rest of your afternoon till we meet next week. Thank you, say bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you.